Bueno, Eguardión, Egunon, um, good morning. Um, I'd just like to introduce now this next table, which is a table of European cases. Uh, this is going to be in English. My name is Maggie Bullen, um, and I'm pleased to be here today to introduce Deirdre O'Connor, uh, first of all, and then Tobias Schulz. First of all, we're going to have uh, Deirdre, so I'll just introduce her, then there'll be her talk. After that, I'll introduce Tobias, then there'll be his talk, and then we'll hopefully have time for some questions at the end. Uh, so Deirdre Connor comes today from Ireland. She's lecturer in resource economics in the School of Biology and Environmental Sciences at the University College of Dublin. And her research interests include agriculture and rural policy analysis, with particular reference to the impact of EU policy on rural communities, food policy, especially the issue of food poverty in Ireland, and in our environmental policy analysis in the Irish and European context. Deirdre has also done um, or does consultancy and research assignments taking commissions from a number of national and international organizations such as the European Commission, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, a range of national statutory agencies in the community and voluntary sector. And today, Deirdre is going to be talking to us and the title of her talk is Social Farming in a Rural Development Context, Challenges and Opportunities. Thank you, Deirdre. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, um, wait a minute. Okay, <laughs> right. So while um, my uh, presentation is, is uploading, uh, first of all, just to, to thank uh, Zerain Lab for the, the opportunity uh, to come. I, I have to say my motivation was too fold. Uh, first of all, obviously very interested in the, uh, the topic and the work that was going on, uh, but also it was my first um, opportunity to visit uh, the Basque country, so that was also a strong uh, incentive uh, to come. So again, thank you so much for the hospitality. It's been really uh, interesting and really enjoyable so far, and I have until Monday to stay in the, in the region, so I'm really looking forward to that. So thank you to, to all involved. So the, the title uh, there is looking at this idea of, of social farming uh, in a rural development context. And my thinking about this was really that it is in line with um, what Jan asked me to uh, think about, which is really some kind of, of new and innovative practices that are happening in, uh, in Europe, but more specifically, I suppose, to talk about the situation in Ireland. Again, in the context of very challenging times, I think, for particularly for Irish uh, farm households at, at the moment. And this, these practices of what we will uh, uh, describe as uh, social farming are in some ways very new, uh, but in other ways very uh, ancient al almost. So I think it, it speaks also to some of the, the themes we have, have looked at uh, already. So just the uh, structure, I have uh, probably now less than 20 minutes, um, but the idea is really that we talk about the idea of social farming for our purposes, so how do we define it, what are we talking about, um, give some overview of social farming uh, initiatives that are happening in, in Ireland, and then for some comparison to look at, at the trends uh, European-wide, and again, that is based on some research initiatives we have been involved with in, in Ireland and at EU level. Um, and then just really look at what that means for, uh, for farm households, 
where are the opportunities and what are the strengths that farm households have in this area, uh, and also what are the, the challenges and, if you like, the, the weaknesses. Um, and then really to look at some issues related to, to policy in Ireland and at EU level. Um, but also I think it's important to make the point at the outset that a lot of this activity in Ireland anyway is happening and has happened really despite any policy support, that it really has been led from within uh, communities and by the initiative of farm households themselves. But there is no doubt that a supportive policy uh, environment, I think, has a lot to uh, contribute. I'm aware that I am the first uh, speaker to uh, present in, in English. Can I just check at the moment that the translators and yourselves can follow that the pace of speaking is okay? Okay, I'll take that as a, as a yes. I got a okay. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, that's good. So let's, let's proceed. Okay, so if we want to uh, define uh, or look at uh, social farming in a very typical academic way, I think we can say there is no broad agreement uh, universally about what social farming is, but in general, it, it covers a lot of uh, different areas, a lot of uh, different uh, activities. But in general, what we are talking about is agricultural or farming activities. Could be horticulture, it could be gardening or community garden initiatives, for example. It could be uh, therapeutic activities with animals, and you know, equine therapy, for example. Uh, or it could be, you know, what we understand typically as family farming activities. So it's, it's combining those activities, um, but in a way that really is aimed specifically at promoting people's mental and physical health and their social well-being. So it's, it's trying to deliver some kind of uh, therapeutic um, intervention or some kind of social uh, inclusion objective uh, using a farm uh, or an agricultural uh, setting. So it, it's really encompassing a lot of different activities through a lot of different channels, but at its core is, is the use of, of farming in various um, dimensions to deliver different types of outcomes to do with mental health, physical health, or, and or social uh, inclusion. Uh, if people are familiar with uh, the literature or the, the practices of, of social farming, um, they might have come across uh, the terms of, of green care or care farming. So, you know, again, in, in EU and international uh, literature, we will see the, the, the same type of, of things. So that's broadly speaking what, what we're uh, talking about. Um, as I said, it's the idea of, of providing a service through uh, a working farm. Uh, and I know that encompasses a lot of different ways of, of working. Um, so again, it's the, the individual, the person, the service user, um, you know, improving their mental or physical health um, by engaging in normal farming activity. So the normal type of, of, of activities and tasks that go on uh, on, on a farm. Um, again, I suppose from a, a rural development perspective, and I think particularly um, I'm speaking about Ireland in, in this context, you know, we have used, it's been mentioned several times, uh, it was mentioned last night, uh, we have used the, the LEADER program in, in Ireland through our rural development program um, 
really as a way of improving uh, service delivery, uh, whether it's health or education or social services, uh, social inclusion services, for example. Um, we are beginning to, to see uh, the use of, of social farming services as a way, as another channel and a very kind of locally based channel as a means of, of delivering some of those services into, into rural uh, communities. Um, and also, and I, again I would stress, I'm, I'm talking about Ireland uh, in, in this context, uh, because I think as we'll see in, in other uh, European countries, there doesn't seem to have been the same uh, link between social farming activities and rural development uh, as there has been in, in Ireland. But the way uh, social farming is, is moving from Ireland, and it's in Ireland, and it is from, I think, a very low base, uh, is that it's really being seen as providing a, an opportunity for, um, in a rural development context, for uh, diversification, for on-farm diversification. Uh, and that is proving increasingly to be very necessary and, and I think we have learned very um, harsh lessons uh, in Ireland from uh, the economic crisis which really took root in 2007. Uh, we have in our farm households uh, about 50 to 55% of them depend on off-farm income uh, to, to make their households viable. Uh, in the past, most of that has come from uh, areas like the construction sector, for example, the services sector. Those sectors were extremely badly hit in Ireland during the, the economic crisis. So there has been a real um, problem for, for Irish farm households uh, in trying to find sustainable sources of, of income diversification. And again, there is a lot of interest uh, in social farming, or a growing interest uh, in social farming as a means of uh, diversifying uh, farm, farm income. Okay, so uh, that's a, a map of, well, that was a map of Ireland. There we are again. Uh, so that's a, a map of Ireland. I'm not sure uh, the extent to which you can see the little red dots. Um, but they represent uh, the fact that really social farming initiatives take place all over uh, Ireland. Of particular interest at the moment in, in Ireland is this region here, which is the, the border between the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland. Um, and again, through rural development actors and agencies in Ireland, uh, we have developed some interesting um, programs on a kind of a north-south basis to look at trying to uh, improve um, the, the provision and uh, the training and the certification of, of social farming. So, so these, uh, this area here, we're starting to see a lot more. Uh, but as you can see, you know, really social farming initiatives throughout Ireland are quite uh, widespread. I promise I'll stop moving around now <laughs> to, the, to the alarm of the, uh, the people who are trying to um, film this. Okay. Okay, just for comparative purposes, um, uh, and apologies, Ireland literally fell off my, my graph, but it's, it's way down at the bottom here. Um, if we look at social farming across uh, Europe, really I suppose that the numbers don't make uh, a, a, a huge uh, amount of difference. It's, so we're looking at in and around 900 social farming initiatives in, in the Netherlands, in, in Holland, for example, uh, smaller numbers in Italy, France, and the UK and Ireland way down at, at the bottom here with about uh, 200 uh, initiatives. And that was actually based on uh, research that is now a little bit out of date. It was done in 2010, 2011, but it still remains I suppose the comprehensive view across Europe of the, the extent of social farming uh, initiatives. Um, it was a project called uh, So Far, which was really um, trying to look at the, the level 
and the type of social farming initiatives that uh, exist across Europe. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, that in a minute. But just to, to note that it's still, you know, countries like the Netherlands and Italy where we see the most uh, social farming uh, initiatives. Um, with Ireland uh, really just down at the, the bottom of the league table. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that it's unimportant in, in, uh, in our context at, at all. Okay, so clearly what we see across Europe uh, is a lot of diversity, both in terms of the service users, of the way in which social farming uh, initiatives are uh, delivered in the way they're structured and so on. Um, so, for example, in the, in the Netherlands, in, in Belgium, particularly in Flanders region in, in, um, uh, in Belgium, in Norway, also in, in Switzerland, uh, we see mainly private uh, family farms and we see a very kind of wide uh, diversity across service users and client groups. So everything from people with uh, intellectual disabilities uh, people with mental health issues, uh, people recovering from various types of uh, addiction, uh, people experiencing, you know, burnout, for example, is a very uh, common uh, um, experience in, in, or it's a very common reason of why people access social farms in the Netherlands, for, for example. Um, the use of social farming for uh, elderly people, people experiencing dementia, um, also, so, social inclusion um, issues specifically to do with maybe migrant groups uh, or just purely as an educational uh, initiative for, for children, for, for school groups. So a very, very diverse range of, as we said, of, of client groups um, and also delivered in a very wide range of, of settings. So, for example, historically uh, in Ireland, um, the main way in which social farming was experienced uh, was as a farm which was attached to an institution. So that could have been maybe a psychiatric hospital or a centre for people with intellectual disabilities or an addiction recovery centre, for example. And it's only very recently, uh, and again with the uh, assistance of uh, European Union programs and rural development actors that were starting to see a big interest and uptake um, among private farms uh, in, in Ireland. Uh, and as I said, we've a, a, a different setting again, I think, in France, where most of the social farms that we see are very um, large scale kind of community or networks of, of community gardens and also uh, centres for people with autism are actually a big uh, user of um, and deliverer of social farm uh, uh, settings. Oh, okay, right, <laughs> okay. Okay, so again, if we look at um, the, the kind of the sectors uh, involved, uh, that in, in countries like the, the Netherlands uh, is really that the health sector has been most involved in kind of promoting uh, social farming. Uh, in the Netherlands, or in, in Flanders rather, it has been the agriculture sector. In Italy and France, it has been the social care sector and in Ireland it has been some kind of a, amalgam of all of all of these but what we have seen in recent years uh, in Ireland is specifically rural development actors and agencies uh, becoming much more uh, in involved. So if we look at you know some of the strengths and some of the, the weaknesses um, I think it's fair to say that specifically in, in Ireland there is actually historically very good practice uh, in, on social farms in Ireland, either institutionally or in a very kind of a private setting, in a very much a domestic uh, setting, which people would not have kind of named as a social farming initiative. But I think it comes back to maybe the issues of, of neighbourhood that, that people talked about uh, a lot today and yesterday, that there would have been often kind of private neighbourly arrangements between families for, for 
uh, household members who wanted to uh, get involved in a therapeutic way on a, on a family farm, that they would be allowed to do so. So there is, in fact, a lot of hidden good practice and, and expertise um, and very good network and resources of, of family farms. Um, and yet, at the same time, you know, if you look at the, the bigger picture, um, even though there's a lot of, of fragmented activity, um, there is really a, a lack of awareness about uh, the practice of, of social farming. So a lot of it going on, but a lot of it quite kind of uh, hidden. Um, and really no clear way forward because of that. And a lot of dependence on local decision makers being supportive of social farming and, and driving it forward uh, like, like that. Um, and in terms of the opportunities and the threats, you know, the whole business of it being innovative is both uh, a, an opportunity, uh, but it's also a threat because people don't understand it and they're, they're not aware of it. Uh, and I think one of the, the, the biggest uh, issues is this idea of it being multi-sectoral, that it expands so many areas of, of policy and so many uh, domains um, that people really don't know where to seek support or they don't know where to uh, start the, the process and start the, the ball rolling, as we would say. So again, I think in Ireland, the role of the... Um, uh, the, the rural development organisations has been very, uh, very pivotal uh, in, in that. Uh, apologies, I, did, I actually stopped my own clock, uh, so that's why I, uh, I was actually uh, going uh, ahead. Right, so just to, to make the, the point about kind of rural development programmes, that um, we are starting to see, in, in, for example, in countries like Belgium, um, there's been a long history of the, the rural development programmes being involved in social farming. In Ireland, historically, those links were, were quite weak. Um, but we now see, for example, programmes like Interreg, this, this programme between uh, regions and in Ireland, between the UK and Ireland, has really helped to drive uh, social farming initiatives through piloting initiatives and through delivering training and, and education. Um, but it's certainly a, a small range of, of countries uh, like Italy and Ireland and Belgium where uh, rural development programmes seem to be used uh, in order to uh, uh, deliver, um, to deliver uh, social farming uh, initiatives. And just to say, you know, that, that historically... Uh, certainly in the last rural development programme, there were multiple, in fact, opportunities through the various uh, axes of, of rural development funding, uh, through leader activities, for example, through quality of life uh, enhancements, through competitiveness uh, aspects. All of those were used certainly in other countries like, uh, like Flanders, for example, and to a smaller extent in Ireland, um, just to kind of shape uh, those, those uh, initiatives in a, in a social farming setting. So there have been uh, opportunities to, 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 to do that. So just to say, you know, the, the, the signals that are, are emerging at European level, there have been a number of uh, opinion pieces coming forth from uh, the European Social and Economic uh, Committee making positive noises that they would like to uh, support uh, social farming. Um, again, the extent to which that actually feeds into European policy seems to be a long and, and kind of tortuous uh, process. Um, in terms of the, the actions and initiatives that are emerging from rural development actors, certainly in Ireland, um, we have drawn quite heavily, as I said, on programmes like Interreg and also on this current uh, rural development programme to try and, and push that uh, agenda. Um, in terms of the channels of influences or, or approaches, uh, really I think the stage we're at now in Ireland is trying to really formalise those networks of the, the hundred or, or so uh, initiatives that are, are going on. Um, to use, as I said, the, the structures like, like LEADER, um, specifically to try to influence uh, policy, and to start building and disseminating the, the evidence that we're getting of uh, particularly the narrative of some service users themselves 
who are, I think, overwhelmingly positive about their experience. If you wish, and I can do it subsequently, um, I have some links to, uh, it's actually English language uh, video links to um, some of our service users and some of our projects just discussing uh, their experience. I didn't show it, as I said, because it's all in English. Uh, but if people would like, we can certainly provide more uh, information on that. So apologies, I've gone a little bit over, but okay. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Deirdre. Okay, thank you very much, Deirdre, for that very interesting presentation. Before we have questions, we're now going to, well, I'm going to introduce Tobias Schulz Marti. He's from the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow, and Landscape, and he's lecturer at the Institute for Political Science at the University of Zurich. Uh, Tobias studied economics and ecological economics at the University of St. Gallen and then stayed on as scientific collaborator at the Institute for Economics and the Environment and was then later assistant at the same university as Institute uh, for Political Science. He did his dissertation concerning the decision anomalies regarding referendums on environmental policies and since then, he's been collaborating in different scientific research projects. The latest, um, what determines local growth management regulation and how does it relate to urban sprawl? I think that's right. the latest, Tobias. Um, and he's got many other projects, which I won't detail now, to give him plenty of time uh, for his talk, which is today... <coughs> I haven't got your title here. No <laughs> I beg There's your pardon. There's a title on the slide, actually. <laughs> uh, we'll let him put his, his slide up, because I don't seem to have the title written down, and I'll let him take over. Thank you, Tobias. Over to you. OK, thank you very much for your nice introduction. Um, and thank you very much for having me here. I'm very pleased uh, for the invitation. I'm very, very honored to, to give a presentation here on the Swiss case. Uh, my motivation to come here was actually that I have done research on those topics, um, regional development and um, summer farming in Switzerland. Uh, although I have been uh, part of a larger team and I probably can't um, answer all your questions that you might have on this, on this topic, I was looking more into how policies um, work out, so kind of an evaluation of policies going on in Switzerland, and, but I will not go into the details of that, I will give you a, the broader picture uh, in my presentation. Um, right, what, is, what you can see here is the rural area of Switzerland, so all what is colored, those are mus municipalities actually, uh, what is colored uh, is considered uh, rural, all that is white is considered the urban area, uh, and we, had, we have had a dissertation at our institute looking into the potential, the entrepreneurial uh, potential um, in those rural areas. So uh, red means there is not much potential and green means there is some potential, right? Uh, I will come back to, to these aspects later, but if we talk about um, rural development, and I will first go into a little bit into the rural de development case and then later coming to the summer farming case. Then we first have to understand um, what are the regional policies in Switzerland, and I think one important thing here is to understand that uh, Switzerland is a confederation of states which are called cantons, and those cantons, they have their own um, they raise their own taxes, right? So a very important aspect of rural development is that there is negotiation between cantons and that there is much money going from the richer cantons to the poorer cantons. It's about one and a half billion Swiss francs per, per year, right? So this is very important, otherwise there wouldn't be much regional development, I think. 
Then we have more traditional uh, policies that, um, uh, that support investments in mountainous regions and about 50 millions of uh, uh, per annum are just costs because of loan defaults, uh, um, so that there's much more money involved. Uh, and then there are more um, innovative uh, instruments, about 70 million go into projects only, so it's only project-based uh, subsidies, if you want, that go into um, projects that are regionally, def regionally defined, right, and that have to, be, have to have an innovative aspect. Those are more like more recent policies, right? So I, I think it's the same in, in every um, European countries that the state wants to not just to uh, give money away like that, but to identify innovative regions, innovative uh, municipalities, and to support them. Right, and then we have a similar thing going on also in agricultural policy, right? So it's not only regional policy, but also agricultural policy that has some funds available to give away for innovative uh, municipalities that where people try to, um, to combine different sectors uh, of the economy, economy, so agricultural combined with tourism or with forest, uh, forest sector. Those uh, things have not turned uh, out that well in certain regions, right? Maybe it's because for in some regions it's not very common for um, farmers to cooperate with other farmers and to cooperate cross-sectorally. But I have not much knowledge about the, the reasons why it worked out better or less in some, in some regions. And then another thing is that we have, as also in, in Europe, I think, all over the place, we have this idea of uh, regional nature parks, which there is not much money involved in that, but it is an opportunity for municipalities to work together, to come together to define um, certain areas, which should then be the core areas, and then other areas which should be the managed areas. And this can be combined with tourism and agriculture to have something like a label uh, to promote products or to promote tourism. This is also something that is quite new, and the municipalities and regions have to apply uh, to be a nature park, right? And then there is a commission that goes, goes into uh, uh, whether this should be um, or not. And also the municipalities have to vote. Sometimes in the municipality there will be votes. Uh, um, the people will be asked whether they want to be part of such a regional park or not, because there are some restrictions involved, of course. Right, so here I have a very complicated graph from um, um, my own research because we were uh, thinking about, well, if we have all those policies and they want to identify innovative regions, right? So how does this work? What is an innovative region? And we had a dissertation going into, looking into that, what are the indicators for innovative regions, and we have found out that one aspect is very hard to, to capture it is this social capital thing, right? And we tried to capture that by uh, sending out a questionnaire to um, about 500 municipalities in, in the rural area, asking them, asking them how many uh, organizations for volunteers do they have and what structure these, these, these uh, organizations have. Have they lots of um, um, organizations which are just combining a homogeneous uh, bunch of people? Or are they those uh, um, organizations that have a very heterogeneous uh, membership, right? And our expectation was that more heterogeneous, more community matters-oriented organizations are also important for municipalities, not only economically uh, uh, oriented organizations. What you can see here, is that the, the line that goes uh, downwards is the probability to have no uh, small enterprise foundation in a municipality. And as you can see, the more um, social community matters oriented organizations we have in a municipality, the, the smaller is the probability that we will not observe any small enterprise foundation. And on the other hand, if we just have a very a lot, a lot of uh, very homogeneous um, um, economic-oriented uh, organizations in a municipality, then the probability of not observing any small enterprise uh, foundation 
uh, increases dramatically if there are too many of those organizations, right? So if, he, if the, the municipality is dominated by, um, by just economically focused, very homogeneous um, um, organizations, then this might even not be a good sign for economic development, right? That's, that was, is one, one of our messages from this research. So, point is, it's good to have some, uh, it can't hurt to have uh, lots of cultural organizations in a municipality. The next aspect is, uh, I'm now going away from regional development, more into the summer farming um, research that we have conducted at our, at our UNC Institute. We have had a large program on alpine summer farming in Switzerland. Those uh, people here are the people that led the program. I was just one collaborator. And uh, what is also very important in the rural area of Switzerland are the alpine pastures. And you can see it's, uh, it's very closely combined, of course, right? So all the mountainous areas where we actually do have the rural areas are also the areas with the alpine pastures. That's, that's clear. Um, what we also know in the meantime is that those pastures are not only important for agriculture, they also, because they are so extensively um, um, used, uh, uh, they are very important also for biodiversity reasons, right? But we have to keep in mind that those are cultural landscapes, so they are managed by or have been created by human beings sending cattle and livestock up to the, the alpine pastures. And the high biodiversity value is because of this management. So, uh, this area is really huge. It's about one-third of the surface that is used by agriculture. Uh, but it only receives 4% of all this, the agricultural subsidies, right? Because it's so extensive uh, uh, agriculture, it's not an intensive agriculture. And it is it even is about one-tenth, one-ninth of the surface of the whole country. <coughs> but of course, the, most of the people, they are living in the, in the lowlands uh, up to the northwest, uh, uh, between Lake Constance and, and Lake Geneva. And uh, the alpine pastures are in the, in the southeast and the south. So, it is important also because it is very diverse, and we have about 7,000 summer farms in Switzerland with 17,000 employees. Uh, and we ha I have to mention also, because this has also been an issue yesterday, many of those, or most of those farms are really good, they're, they're highly accessible, right? So we do have streets, it's not all by foot. Uh, and we have a huge variety of legal forms and, and different management systems. We have uh, lots of um, um, community-owned, Pastures, right? And I have to say that mostly those are the pastures that are not that productive. So the, the problematic pastures are usually those that are um, not privately owned. And then we have privately owned uh, summer pastures and uh, lots, man, many of those uh, farms that are run by a family and the summer pastures belong to the family farm. So this is very closely combined between the home base farm and the summer farm up in the mountains. Uh, so summer farming is still important for the Swiss agricultural sector. We have about 50,000 uh, farms in Switzerland, and uh, some of them are not suitable for summer farming because they do not have the right uh, uh, livestock categories, but most of them have livestock categories that can be sent to summer pastures, right? So they have cattle and, and um, sheep and goats. Uh, not all of the cattle is, uh, is suitable because many of them in the meantime are... are um, um, I mean, uh, high, highly productive milk cows that will not be able to walk the steep slopes in the mountains anymore. But still, uh, uh, half of the, um, so of the farms in the lowlands do actually send uh, animals to the, to the, 
the summer page just during, during the three months in the summer. It's more or less three months. Um, I think it's longer here because it's a little bit lower. Right, so it is still is an important aspect of, uh, of uh, Swiss agriculture. And if you look at that chart, you can see that um, most of the, uh, of the uh, cattle that is sent to the summer pastures are milk cows and uh, other cattle. And then we have um, a decline in milk cows. That's also quite important because um, uh, this has to do with structural change in agricultural, uh, agriculture in Switzerland. There are not so many milk cows anymore because the milk price is really uh, way down. So we have a structural change towards more suckler cows, right? So uh, accordingly, if you have more ca suckler cows in the lowlands, more suckler cows will be sent to the summer patients during, during summer. So suckler cows have been increasing, milk cows have been decreasing. In some or in netto, is, uh, it, it's assumed that it is a, a small decrease in livestock that can be sent to summer patients. Sorry? About five minutes. Five ago. minutes, I know. Thanks. Uh, right, then what we have to keep in mind is that with um, uh, climate change, there is a um, high pressure at the meantime uh, on those summer pastures uh, in terms of reforestation. And if the, the number of livestock is going down, and if um, lifestyles do change, and if there is not enough money to pay uh, people, uh, herdsmen and people and, and dairymen that should stay uh, on, on the Alps, then there is also the danger that there uh, will be much of uh, much abandonment. Um, well, it's not the abandonment of, of single summer farms, but the abandonment of certain pastures, right? So the very difficult pastures that are far away and very steep, they will be given up first. So we do have an increase in forests in the mountain area, also because of the abandonment of, of pastures. And the chart on the... Um, uh, right-hand side uh, indicates that this is also a problem for biodiversity. As I mentioned before, uh, the, the biodiversity value on the alpine pastures is highest if we have some structure of, of shrubs there, but not if we have just only uh, uh, bushes, right? So it's acceptable to have a little bit less intensive, less um, 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 grazing, but if the grazing uh, disappears entirely, then we have just only uh, bushes left, and then the biodiversity uh, value will decrease. Okay, we have, we have uh, contacted farmers and distributed questionnaires to find out what are their motivations to still send uh, uh, livestock to the alpine pastures. And we see that it's still they, they, they still want to increase their fodder base, right? So for them it's important to have additional patients during summer in the Alps to have more um, fodder, to have higher, uh, larger herds of, of cattle. It's also important to do that in terms of anim animal health, but it's still one of the, those are just the, the most important reasons, right? It, it's still an important reason because it is a pleasure to do it and because tradition tells us that we should do it, right? So the, the farmers do also stick to traditions and they still like to do that. Then we also um, send questionnaires to people visiting Alps to find out what, are, what, what do they think about uh, alpine um, um, pasture management in, the, uh, in Switzerland. And it's not very surprising, but we find out that the people actually want this as a part of Swiss identity, right? So most of them say that they would regret an abandonment and that it is a, genu uh, a genuine part of Switzerland. The, the, the red line and the green line are the differences if we uh, look at the red line uh, is the mean over the entire Switzerland population and the green line is uh, if you just look at a certain region, which, which I will introduce a little bit later also, uh, for which, we, uh, which is a very alpine um, traditional region that, uh, for in, in which um, summer farming is still very important. It's this region here. 
that's, was, that's one example, and I took it because it reminds me a little bit of the region, uh, of your region, actually here in, in the Basque Country. Uh, it's mostly privately led uh, summer farms. Uh, they still have uh, many milk cows. They're mostly smaller farms, and they are um, very strong-minded, traditional people, right? And we have found here that they were able to cooperate, maybe because they're a little bit uh, set aside, right? So they're not very well connected to the city. It's, it's difficult, difficult to get there. Uh, so they still have their own identity. Uh, and I think this has helped them to actually come together and to define uh, uh, their own regional park project and to su successfully set up an, an AOC label for their, for their regional cheese they, they are producing. The other example is uh, the Mesolcina uh, Valle Calanca in uh, the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland. It's not belonging to the canton of uh, Ticino. It's still belonging to the canton of uh, Grison, uh, which is actually um, uh, in, uh, more a German-speaking uh, canton, but it has some Italian-speaking parts. And here we have a different situation, right? It's not so... It's still uh, remote, but it's not so uh, that they have their very strong uh, own identity. They're much more connected to the next bigger city, which is Berinzona. They have very difficult pastures, right? So they are more, they're not privately owned, most of the, the summer farms, but they are more community summer farms. And they have very uh, um, um, extreme conditions. So the, the summer farms extend from 1,050 to 2,600 meters, so it's enormous uh, differences in altitude. Uh, so it's very difficult also to manage and to bring cattle up there, and they have not enough cattle, cattle in the meantime to, to fill up the farms anymore. So they're experimenting with new forms, for example, donkeys, uh, but they don't, do, do not have much dairy production also, so it's difficult for them to build up an identity also around a certain product, right? Uh, as, as I've seen, as we have seen in the, in the example before. So I have to come to an end. Um, right, so uh, this last slide shows you how the direct payment program in Switzerland has been reformed. And it, I can't go into the details, but I just will tell you that ever more of the direct payments will be paid for regionally defined groups of people that have uh, projects together, right? Oh, yeah, that's the signal. Uh, so I think in, in, the, in the example here, the people are much more, much better, um, have, much, have found a much better uh, situation together than in the, in the region here. And uh, probably uh, we have to face it that some regions in Switzerland will at some point have to abandon uh, uh, summer farming also because they won't receive any subsidies anymore because they have not uh, uh, defined their, their regional projects. Okay, that's it. Uh, just to mention, uh, we have produced films out of our projects that can be, um, uh, that, 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 that give information from farmer to farmer. So farmers explain how they uh, manage their summer farms uh, to other farmers. And we have also produced a, a larger film. Uh, there's a link here, maybe some of, you, some of you, they can access this. And then we have also produced a book uh, on all our wisdom, right? Uh, so it's only available in French, German, and Italian. I'm sorry, not in English and not in Spanish, and um, I'm unfortunately also not in the Basque language. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Bye. Bueno, eh, baina agian etorri beharko dira, ona? Agian... Deirdre, do you want, would you like to come back? So, apparently we have just five minutes, five minutes for questions, so if anybody would like to ask any questions to either Deirdre or Tobias or to any of the people who are on the previous uh, board, please do so. Just please be as brief as possible so that as many people can ask us uh, who want to. 
Okay. Yes, thank you. May, May, uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, bueno, a uh, que está bateando, buscando una nueva nick, pensando en que al de ti que, que os interesa que ya que están dirá el gusti, ya, en el que está Ba, eskolaren garrantzia noski oinarri oinarrezko eruditzen zait, ez da? Etorkizuneko herri txikiak ezpaitira izango eskolarik ezpaldi madute eta ez dute etorkizunik izango noski. E, eta gaur hemen azaldu diren gauza gehienen iturri nagusia e, identidade falta bat edo dela pentsatzen dut, herri txikitan galdu deguna, e, Sorte es e, ba, Jaime, Jaime, usted es la, ahí va tu dueña, es gara y dichi izquierdo, avisen a que el dicho es es gara y dichi, ahí llegó era tamal carrera, ahora indic, es rechiquilla, visitic de yugo, veño, identidad de crisis, a un diva ten está, orden identidad de orri, vuelta a tomar merdio, está ahora, ni que usted preste un merdio, la, erita gustio. E, Simiento nagusi batzuk edo elkarrekin jartzeko. E, gu eskoletatik azken urteetan ari gea pixka bat e, gure paradigma berria edo zein izan beharko luken edo pentsatzen eta konpartitu nahiko nuke hemen zaudeten guztiokin porque gure paradigma eskolarako balia garria izan behar du gero herrirako noski. E, eta paradigma hori oinarritzen da esan duan nortan, ez da? Lenengo, hori, incómodo se el eh, Paradigma hori, azteko lehenengo pentsatu behar daukeu eh, zein den gure identidadea. Eh, nor garen, nolakoak, eta horri buruz pentsatu behar dugu guztiok. Hau da, gauden guztiok. Eta horren oinarri nagusiak, nik uste dut bi puntutan, eh, bi zimientu nagusitan edo bi sustrai nagusitan jarri behar ditugula ez, batetik, e, erriak, erri izango baldin baira guztionzat modukoak izan behar dute eta hori hola izateko aniztasuna, aberastasuna dela ikusi behar daukagu, ez da? E, eta bueno, guk eskolatik hori landu nahi degun bezala, guztatuko litzaiak erri txikietatik ere refleksio hori kontutan hartzea, ez da? Azken urteetako identitate krisi honen iturri nagusietako bat Gure caso de Tamensat, Birpobla si vais a andar a coes, eta Birpobla si ortan, va a emandir en el anzune igual, vea a Radinia con Dembora, esa es que ni sana es, Gaur Dembora eres, veste a la sota con Batisana es, y tal día, Mochak, Mostu de Recoac Veneta de Reyes, eta, claro, Dembora vea la causa cuando pensa se cota, Dembora ore que mango de Guba, el anzuna es que es arcera, era mango de Yu, eres chiquita, urte a escotan ser, el anzuna. Azkar egi edo hartu direla pentsatzen dut, oso kolpeka bezala, ba, etorri ala arazoa ba, konpon bide eman, eta normalen hola konpontzen diren arazoak iri estrukturetatik hartzen dira, hau da, iri egituretatik, eta iri egituretak, iri egiturek, iri arauek ez digute bali erri txiki, ez erri ei eta ez eskolei eta ez erri hoietan bizigaren biztan lei. Hortun, bueno, Reflexio erako puntu bezala nik uste dut, ba, guztion naotan egon dela horrelako zerbait, ba, gu erritar bezala ere izan dezagun hori. Ha, besterik ez. Ezkerrek asko, ez dakit, hemengo norbait zerbait erantzun nahi dio, edo jasko dugu beste, badago beste esnarketa bat, ezkerrek asko, aurrera. Eh, me ha gustado la exposición que ha hecho el amigo suizo, sobre la exposición de los proyectos, de subvencionar los proyectos directos. Sabemos que Suiza no está dentro del ámbito de la Comunidad Europea, pero sus leyes se enfocan a, en relación a ella. Entonces, eh, aquí pasa lo siguiente, con esto quiero excluir a Euskal Herria, la Comunidad Europea, o sea, la política agraria común, 
prácticamente ya desde su, su principio ya venía viciada. Entonces, pasa lo siguiente, que no ha habido una supervisión directa de esas subvenciones a quienes ha ido, de qué manera se han gestionado. Esto me recuerda, en marzo tuvimos un, vamos, un foro sobre el, análisis de, el futuro el análisis de, del futuro del autogobierno vasco. En ella hubo una exposición de tres eh, estados, Baviera, Suiza, Escocia y Flandes. Fue mirar a través de una ventana una manera de gobernarse que no tiene el gobierno español. Es que, como muchas veces suelo decir yo, pasas de Miranda para adelante, Miranda de Evo, o sea, ya Castilla, Miranda de Evo, y ves la cosa de otra manera. Pasas ya de los Pirineos, como digamos, ves otro, otro ambiente. ¿Qué es lo que pasa? Pues prácticamente pues, que vaya la capa caída, por ejemplo, en la zona donde vivo yo, en Castilla, pues que no, que no tira para adelante. El despoblamiento es atroz, se han vuelto pueblos cortijo, no quiero decir generalizar en todos, pero sí existe ese problema. Han parado, digamos, entre comillas, pues tal vez por las mismas instituciones, por eso ya quiero decir, quiero excluir a Oscar Ría, porque aquí es otra cosa, que vamos, que ya vienen las... Bueno, con esto quiero terminar. Vale. Ahorrera. Ni Jaime Esquerdo y Susana Nadine Echayo. Sur el Uruan, la casa de mi padre el Uruan, Iru Gausari, Garancia Unia, Maten Dioso. Solita y la DEA, Sines Garritasuna, Etalana. Tengo ustedes, Tau. Comunidad de visita básico de quien gausa de esta vea rascoagaña, ori piscabat sábado cual son que bueno, esa, esa era en, en, en Oviedo tenemos una, una tertulia que se, que se llama. Cambiamos el mundo por un plato de lentejas, entonces nos juntamos ahí y, y exponemos eh, un tema que se ha elegido y sobre él se habla. ¿no? En, en, la, en la primera edición o la primera tertulia se tituló «Del pasado campesino, ¿qué va para el futuro, qué va para el museo?». ¿no? Precisamente para, 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 para que no todo fuera para el museo. La única referencia que hay al pasado campesino son, son los museos. Cuando en realidad lo que acabas de comentar, esos tres valores que son valores de futuro, es decir, estos son los que nos deberían, los, los de, deberían de servir para la construcción de la nueva sociedad rural, que va a rescatar valores y principios y tendencias de las que se habla en la modernidad. ¿no? Ahora se, se habla de energías renovables, de solidaridad, de cooperación, de todos esos elementos, pero es que esos elementos ya estaban en, en el pasado. Es decir, por tanto, la propia, la propia definición de sostenibilidad, hay un tratado de 1711 de... Fray Toribio de Santo Tomás y Pumarada, que escribe el Arte General de Granjerías, que, que es un tratado precisamente para recopilar toda la información de cómo se maneja correctamente una, una granja o una aldea, y, y dice en castellano antiguo, se refuta al conservar por lo mismo que producir. Por tanto, lo mismo es estar conservando una cosa que estarla siempre produciendo. Es decir, a partir de ahí poco más hay que decir que ayer preguntábamos sobre qué era el desarrollo sostenible. Pues esto, ¿no? Es decir, por tanto, en esas sociedades el concepto de conservar y de desarrollo no tenía diferencia. Es decir, lo que había que hacer era desarrollar para conservar y se conservaba porque se desarrollaba. Es decir, ese tipo de, todo ese, ese repaso importante ¿no? a, a, los, a los valores que comentas tú, es decir, esto en algún momento se nos olvidó contarlo en la escuela a partir de los años 60, las escuelas que se crean en la ciudad, ¿no? Y ahora de repente esa sociedad desapareció y encima cuando uno hace referencia a ella dice, joder, pero si ya está sobrepasado dice que eso no está sobrepasado eso, eso, eso está ahí y formará parte 
el futuro. Yo poco más tengo que decir también porque creo que, que somos coincidentes. ¿no? Ahora la cuestión es cómo lo incorporamos a la modernidad, cuáles son los mecanismos para llevar a la práctica todo eso que yo creo que en, en, estamos todos de acuerdo, ¿no? pero que no acabamos de, de, de concretar. ¿no? Mr. Schutz, if I could, please. Um, I have the impression that the governments, are, even the, the Swiss people in general, have, uh, have tried to maintain the rural life very much. I don't know whether I'm correct or not, but that's the impression that Switzerland gives. But on the other hand, I'm not really sure how many of these people actually live of the rural economy or not. And I don't know at the end how much, uh, so to say, what is the per percentage of this rural economy apports to the actual wealth of the country? So to say, how many of these people in rural lives dedicate themselves really to rural economy or actually live of other more classical uh, Swiss sectors? Yeah, well, I can't give you any, any exact numbers, but, uh, <laughs> but you are right. Uh, we also have to keep in mind uh, everything that is rural and, and agriculture can only exist because of uh, subsidies and direct payments, right? So this is a huge, um, uh, um, much money is coming from the economic centers and is distributed to the countryside through um, regional development funds and also through agricultural subsidies. It's clear. It's clear. But I think the people in the rural countryside, they try to maintain uh, their traditional lives. And, and uh, as you said, it's an impression. But also they try to modernize. And uh, much of Switzerland is very well um, accessible. You know, we have uh, streets everywhere. And everything is uh, working by car. And we have trains everywhere. And we have public transport, transportation everywhere. So. Um, uh, it's not that difficult to live on the countryside and still be a little bit modern. Uh, so, 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 since I'm not living myself on the countryside, I can't give you um, it, uh, an impression from my own experience. I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, you're right. I think much of it is just only also possible because Switzerland is a, is a rich country and there's much uh, distribution going on. Thank you.